Okay, uh, Bill, are you ready to, to go? I could introduce you. Okay, everybody, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it is our very first lecture of the season. So we're happy you're here on a beautiful day and you decided to join us rather than enjoy the outdoors. <laughs> it means a lot to us. I'm uh, Thomas Manzikidis, uh, the new president of the Hellenic Link Midwest. I'd like to welcome everybody. I just want to make quick, some announcements um, for membership dues. If you have not paid your 2024 membership dues, we have our uh, treasurer, Angelo, sitting in the back. He's got membership forms. He would accept payment right now. So please, uh, when you get a chance after the lecture, please see Angelo. Also, I'd like to make an announcement about our next event on a Sunday, November 10th. The Hellenic Link Midwest will present Dr. Elizabeth H. Prodromu in a lecture titled Cultural Heritage, Human Rights and Community Sustainability, Turkey's Weaponization and Cultural Heritage Against the Ecumenical Patriarchate and Greek Orthodox Community. The event will take place at 3 p.m. at the Four Points by Sheridan Hotel, uh, 10249 West Irving Park Road at Schiller Park. I'm sure many of you, we've, we've had these uh, past lectures at the same location. You're familiar with uh, the Four Points by Sheridan. Um, the lecture will be supported by the Hellenic Foundation Chicago. We'd like to thank them, as always, for their continued support. Okay, so for today's lecture, um, entitled A Neolithic Pompeii, the Archaeology of Alepotripa Cave in Diros Beimani, going to introduce our speaker. Uh, William Parkinson is curator and head of anthropology at the Field Museum of Natural History, where he also is associate director of research. Bill also is professor of anthropology at University of Illinois at Chicago. He and Attila Gyucha, I hope I said the name right, uh, co-direct the Koros Regional Archaeological Project in Hungary. Bill also co-directs the Southern Mani Archaeological Project in Greece with Chelsea Gardner and Rebecca Seafried. His research explores the social dynamics of early village societies and the emergence of early states. So with uh, no further ado, Bill, welcome to the Hellenic Link for our first lecture of the season. Nice applause, nice, hand of, uh, nice round of applause, please. Hi, everybody. Kalispera. Thank you for being here on this beautiful day. It's probably the last day we're going to get a nice Sunday afternoon like this in Chicago. So I really, I really appreciate you uh, taking taking time out of your week to, to be here with me. Um, what I'd like to do uh, today is tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about my experience in Greece and having worked there now for uh, more than three decades. Uh, it's uh, a place that I love. I am not Greek. Sorry. You know, I know. But uh, I am a huge Hellenophile. Um, and so a big part of my, my career has been dedicated to uh, teaching people about Greece um, and about the, the history of Greece and the archaeology of Greece. And so what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about my experience and my uh, my academic motivation, what I'm interested in and how that fits into the bigger, bigger world that we live in. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about my work at the Field Museum. Um, and then uh, my previous work at Alapotripa and my current project in uh, Southern Mani. Um, it really, you know, I, I always enjoy coming to these uh, to these talks, uh, it's it's really important um, for me to uh, talk to you about your past. It's and I view it as a, a true privilege, uh, and so it's just wonderful to come here and to see meet some new people, but also to see some some known faces in the, in the audience. Um, okay, so we're going to start very big picture as a, as an a academic as an anthropologist. 
Um, one of the things I'm interested in is the evolution of cities. Humans did not evolve to live in big cities. This is weird and new for us. Humans evolved to live in small, little hunting and gathering groups that didn't get very big and that moved around a lot. It's odd for us to live in massive, massive towns like Chicago. Uh, in fact, as of 2018, more than half of all of the people in the world live in urban environments now. So that's, that's new and different. Um, the other thing that's new and different for us is the amazing amount of inequality, economic, political uh, inequality that we see in the world. This is also new for us. Um, in 2017, Oxfam reported that all of the wealth in the world was owned by these eight dudes. So you take all of the wealth in the entire world of 8 billion people and you give half of it to these eight guys. That's, that's an unprecedented amount of economic and political and social inequality that we have never experienced as a species on the face of the planet. So even at the height of the Roman Empire, we are way beyond the amount of inequality in our current society. And while most people think of archaeology as a discipline that, you know, deals with the deep past, it's kind of obscure, it's not really relevant, uh, I, I disagree. Because all of these patterns that started to create the world that we live in today, that is urbanism, living in big groups, and the beginnings of inequality, these all started way deep in the past. These started long before people started writing things down. And in many ways, the only way we can come to understand how we got where we are today is by doing archeology, span because the vast majority of what's going on here is prehistory. This is before we have writing. And so what my research as an anthropologist and an archeologist is focused on is, is this phase right here between farming villages and cities and states. What I'm interested in is why did some farming villages stay small for thousands of years in certain parts of the world? In other parts of the world, within a couple generations of having the first sedentary farming villages, you get very complicated political forms with urban centers. So that's what I'm interested in. Why did that happen in some parts of the world? Why did it not happen in other parts of the world? And the way that I think about this academically, and this is a, this is a problem of archeology, span because what we see in the archeological record is stuff that worked. When we find something in the archeological record, it was a success. It had already taken off. It had lasted long enough for us to be able to identify it in the archeology. span What we don't see are all of those, those false starts. If, you, if you're watching a football game, everybody gets up to the line of scrimmage, they're all ready to run a play. They're gonna run that play. Something goes wrong and it doesn't work. They got to hit the reset button, take a couple yards back, and try to rerun that play. And what I've learned from my archaeological research is more and more frequently, the world consisted of a bunch of false starts, people who got together and tried to make something happen and couldn't get it to work. So we're biased. When we look back on the past, what we're biased by are those successes. And so a big part of my research is focused on those false starts and trying to understand those false starts in the past. Um, I've had the privilege of working on this issue in two different parts of Southeastern Europe. Uh, as Tom mentioned, in the, the Great Hungarian Plain where I've been running a project with my colleague Attila Juha for the last um, three decades as well, and also in Southern Greece, where I started as a, a second year undergraduate student at UIC, first working on a project in Southern Evia, and then in Messenia, and most recently in Mani. So 
in my other world, my academic world, my museum world at the Field Museum, a big part of my job is building exhibitions. Uh, when I first got to the museum, they asked me to do an exhibition on Genghis Khan. I know nothing about Genghis Khan. I'm not, I'm not a scholar in the, that period or that part of the world. Um, but I learned, and I learned that my job is largely about taking these exhibitions and making them accessible to people in different parts of the world. Um, so after working on a bunch of shows, some of which I knew something about, Lasco, the, the beautiful cave paintings in France, I know a little bit about that. I've been teaching about that for 30 years. Vikings don't really got much. It's out of my wheelhouse. Uh, it was in 2016 that we did an exhibition um, called The Greeks from Agamemnon to Alexander the Great. And this was an exhibition that we put together with our colleagues from Canada and National Geographic that highlighted ancient Greek culture from the Mycenaean period until the time of Alexander the Great. Uh, and this was really the first time that I, I felt like I had the ability to work on an exhibition that uh, was something that was in my wheelhouse, something that I really knew and understood. And it, this show was a, just a tremendous success. And I bring this up because exhibitions are a very unique opportunity for an academic to have an impact way beyond, I've written a bunch of books and a couple dozen people have read them. That's the nature of, of academic world. You write stuff and you hope some other people will read it and think it might be important. With an exhibition like this, we had the opportunity to bring the glory of ancient Greek culture to 750,000 people in North America. That's real impact. That's really something that, that can communicate to the masses. Um, I just wanted to mention that the National Hellenic Museum helped us. They co-sponsored this exhibition with us. And so John Calamos and his group uh, re really did a lot to help us fund uh, and bring this exhibition to, to North America. Anyway, if you go online, there's quite a bit about that exhibition that's out there. We generated quite a few books. Uh, it was the highlight of a, a National Geographic series on ancient Greece as well. And this is part of my broader academic experience, which is looking at different parts of ancient Greek culture, uh, focusing primarily on the Mycenaean period. So this is the period at the end of the Bronze Age that Homer was writing about in his epic poems hundreds of years later. So what I'd like to focus on today is uh, this project that we called the Deros Project in Deros Bay in Western Mani. Um, so we're down here on the southern tip of the, the Peloponnesos, south of Sparta, just south of Ariopoli. Um, we're, in fact, in the next bay south of Ariopoli. Um, and this is a, a very unique part of Greece. Uh, it's unlike other parts of the Peloponnesos. It's unlike central Greece. It's unlike northern Greece. And it's not like the islands. Uh, Mani has a very distinct flavor. Uh, you know, part of that is created by, by the geography itself, where you've got the massive Taigetos mountain range that carves Mani off from the rest of the Peloponnesos. And so if you're standing in Sparta and you look to the west, you're looking at Taigetos. Um, so this is uh, in May. Right, so here we are in southern Greece. We're up in the mountains. We got snow, right? Um, and this is not uncommon in that part of uh, of Greece. This is I love this photo. This is I ripped this off of Google Earth. This is one of the great things about Google Earth, and you can really see uh, how the 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 geography of Mani is totally different from the rest of Greece. Here, it's mountain, a little bit of dirt, and then sea and its rocky sea coast. Um, and so our research has focused on this part of the world since 2010. It's also as far south as you can get in Europe and still be in Europe. When you get to the southern tip of Mani uh, and you walk from uh, Tainaron out to the lighthouse, uh, you're as far south as you can be and still be on, on the European, European continent. Most people know Mani 
uh, from the writings of Patrick Lee Fermer. Uh, Patrick Lee Fermer uh, was a Brit. He was in the military, traveled all throughout Southeastern Europe and wrote a very, very famous travel memoir on money. This is Patty on the left there staring down a goat on a boat. Um, he, he was quite an individual. And uh, if you go to the town of Cardamili in Mani, uh, you can actually see the Patrick Lee Firmer Museum where he lived when he retired from the, the British military. Um, other folks know Mani from the more recent past, uh, which is uh, focused on uh, blood feuds, between tribes, Mani is, is frequently characterized as sort of the raw part of Peloponnesos. You know, they they Maniots love that uh, Mavro Michalis comes from the village of Limeni, who led the charge against the Ottomans. Um, and Mani has forever seen itself as independent, and it still is very independent from the rest of Greece. Um, you know, if you go. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, the the Mani Mani flag. Anybody know what's on the Mani flag? You know what it says? Yeah, yeah, the flag. Right, right. This is this is the Mani flag, right? And you know what it says on it? Tan e epitan. <laughs> the Maniats they love their Spartan history. Come back with your shield or on your shield, buddy. Um, in a in a very Laconian phrase, uh, and so people have, in a way, glorified sort of this recent past of Mani, which focused on the construction of these of these stone built towers that were the focus of internecine blood feuds between people that were living either in the same village or in neighboring villages. Um, one part of our work as an archaeologist, when we go back and study the deep past of this part of the world, is we can actually trace when those kinds of social dynamics started to occur. And they occur much earlier than many people thought, going back to the end of the Roman occupation of the region. Other folks know of Mani because of the site at the southern point of Mani called Tainaro. Uh, and this is a, a sanctuary of Poseidon that is associated with a death oracle. And this is one of the places on the Peloponnesos that people saw as the entrance to the underworld. And this is actually where I'm working now. I'm working down in southern, the southern tip of Mani. So I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit more about this at the end. But what got us involved in this project in 2010 was this site called Alepotripa. Um, so Alepotripa is located in this horrible spot to work, Diros Bay. It's just, it's not, it's not pleasant to be in at all. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a wonderful spot to be. Um, and this is a, a cave that was... You know, as you can imagine, Alepo, Tripa, Alepu, Tripa, right? Foxhole Cave. Um, it was discovered in the 1950s by actually my, my good friend's dad, uh, who owned the land. And it is the standard story of, you know, somebody chasing a, somebody chasing a dog into a hole and finding this amazing archaeological resource. And it's, it's just around the corner as we're looking into the bay from the, the west here. Most people are familiar with this from Taspiliatu Viru, the caves of Diros, which every little Greek kid was pushed through on Varkes. You be pushed through on a little boat. And these are geological caves. These are located at sea level, as you can see. You're pushed through this. Um, and you go about a, a kilometer and a half back into the cave and you come back. Well, those caves, including Vlihada here, um, those caves are part of a much bigger cave system that runs all throughout the hills in eastern Mani. And so Alepotripa is located not at sea level, good for us, 
but just above sea level. And it's actually an earlier iteration of the cave and has moved up because of seismic change over time. And this is a, a project that was run by, uh, initially by Dr. Yorgos Papathanasopoulos, uh, who at the time was an honorary F4 of antiquities. Uh, he was uh, quite a character and had been working at the cave since it was originally discovered in the 1950s. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's great about archaeology is that it's a team sport. Right. This is not work that we can ever do on our own. Uh, and so we work with a, a large group of international colleagues, including Dr. Anastasia Papatanasiu, uh, Dr. Panayotis Karkanas, and my colleague Michael Galati. So, yeah, you can imagine. So the book says Papatanasopoulos, Papatanasiu, Karkanas, Galati, and Parkinson. Right. Uh, one of these things is not like the other. Um, but uh, it was a lot of fun. We ran this project. Uh, I just put this up to give you a sense of the scale of international colleagues and students that had worked on this project with us. Um, Yorgos and uh, Papadanasopoulos unfortunately died a few years ago, uh, but not until we were able to present him with the feshrift of the publication of our work that was dedicated to him uh, in his honor. Um, what we were trying to do when we got involved in 2010 was to put the cave of Alepotripa, the, the archaeological cave of Alepotripa, into a broader context. That is, we wanted to understand how it related to other sites around it. Uh, this is my colleague Mike uh, Galati and Yorgos Papatanasopoulos. Uh, this is about 10 years ago, and his little dog Zuzu that went with him everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing this takes is money. And so we were very fortunate to get funding from a variety of sources, including your tax dollars, thank you very much, through the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, and uh, through uh, a, a variety of different funding sources, including National Geographic and... Uh, individual individual donations. And so what we wanted to do was uh, go back to this cave that had been known since the 1950s. It started to be excavated in the 1960s. Uh, during the junta, Papathanasopoulos was in jail for a short amount of time, and it was taken over by a French group. Um, and then when, when Yorgos got out of jail, he went back to working at uh, Alepotripa, and we came in many years later. So we're really building on, on his shoulders the work that he had done for nearly 30 years. We were able to come in and help him fi finish it up. Okay, so this is a map of Alapotripa when it was originally identified. You can see you've got uh, agricultural terraces going right from the coast, a small, small church built by the guy who identified it. Uh, his name was Kiriakos Kilakos. Uh, and this was all owned by the Kilakos family uh, in the 1950s. Uh, when the cave was identified, and here I've taken an old map, which is why it's a little blurry, and I've laid actually the size of Alepotripa on top of the map, right? And so you're looking at, at an aerial photograph looking down on it, right? And you can see the cave, which goes several hundred meters, nearly a full kilometer back into the hill. Uh, this is a, a very, very big cave. Um, well, in the 1950s, when, when the, the site was originally identified, uh, the Greek Ministry of Tourism said, hey, you know what we should do? We should make it a show cave. So we're going to start blasting back the entrance to the cave, uh, put in walkways, and uh, make it a, a sound and light show that people can walk through. Uh, and this happened actually in many caves throughout Greece uh, in the 1960s. And so Yorgos Papathanasopoulos was Ephoros in Sparta. He was, he was in charge of the Greek archaeological service in Sparta when some of the guys who were working on the project started bringing to him Zambilia filled with 
um, pottery, stone tools, human bones. And Yorgos, as Ephor, had the ability to shut down the work that was already building out the cave. But as you can see, the original entrance here, which started as a tiny little hole, had already been blasted back. Uh, and this has very important repercussions for us for a variety of different regions, reasons, in large part because people don't live in caves. People live outside caves. They live at the mouth of caves. Caves are gross. They're dirty. You don't want to raise a kid in a, a deep cave. They're dangerous. So people live at the front of the cave, not inside the cave. Um, and so what happened was within, within about five years, we went from it looking like this when it was discovered to this, which is what it looks like now. So the entire entrance to the cave is completely gone. They built a museum at the entrance to the cave, put in a road and uh, trashed everything in front of it. I'll come back to this. The reason it's important is because Yorgos quickly learned that uh, this was a very unique site, uh, not only within Greece, but within Europe and the world. Um, those parts that hadn't been destroyed by the blasting, and when I say blasting, I mean dynamite blasting. That's how you do it. You drill a hole and you drop, drop a dynamite stick in it and blow it up and then do another one, right? Um, uh, preserved a a cave that had been used from the very first time we had farmers in Southeastern Europe, the very first farmers about 8,000 years ago until the end of the Neolithic period and the beginning of the Bronze Age. So for about 3,000 years, you had folks using this cave and it looks like the entrance collapsed because of an earthquake sometime around 3000 BC and nothing Nothing happened inside the cave for 3,000 years until it was discovered by Mr. Kilakos. So you effectively had a Pompeii scenario inside of this cave. In some instances with people even preserved on the surface of the cave, these are pot shirts just laying on the surface, broken ceramics just laying on the surface of the cave. Uh, and you even had people laying on the surface of the cave that seemed to have been trapped inside when the entrance collapsed. Um, here, what you're looking at is another niche of the cave that wasn't destroyed. Uh, and you can see this little depression, little depression right here. That's, that's a vothros, that's a, a, an excavated pit that was used for collecting water that was dripping off. We're in Southern Mani here, right? Water's a big deal. Uh, there's brackish water at the back of the cave, which is a huge deal. But in the front of the cave, we have all of these features that were dug into the rocks specifically to collect water that was dripping through the karstic limestone above them. Um, and then everything else you're looking at there is ceramics. So you, can't, you couldn't walk inside the cave without crunching ceramics under your feet because it was used so intensively. Um, as I mentioned, there also were people trapped on the surface of the cave. And on the, on the left is, you can see a skeleton that's face down. And on the right is a, 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 a skull of a child. And all of that material on the top is, is karstic deposit, limestone, calcium carbonate that drips off of the limestone and that creates a crust on the surface. So we know that that individual was laying on the surface when the cave collapsed and then was covered up by that natural process of, of the calcium carbonate dripping on top of it. So what Yorgos discovered when he started working at the cave in the 1960s was this unprecedented uh, site that was occupied throughout the duration of the Neolithic period. That's very rare to have in Greece. Usually people move around a lot. They'll live in one place for a few hundred years then they'll move to another place. Here they were using the cave for, for 3000 years continuously. And I'll tell you about how we know that. Um, and this very, very unique deposit with this, uh, 
this brackish water lake that actually, when they built the museum in the 1960s, they actually pumped the water. You can imagine this. They're pumping the water to run the toilets and the sinks in the bathroom from this, this brackish water deposit in the 1960s. Um, uh, this room here, you know, and so it, it's always difficult for me to get across what caves look like because they're three-dimensional. So I can show you a two-dimensional picture, but until you're there, you don't really get it, you know? When you go in, you go in through the modern entrance. So this room here is about twice the size of this room, just to give you a sense, right? And then you go to the back of that and there's a little tube that goes down. You go down about 10, 15 meters, and then you go through a very, very narrow hallway and it gets narrow and narrow and narrow to a point that you originally had to crawl through. And then you get to the back and it opens up into this cathedral room, this room right here with the lake at the back of it. And this room is so big uh, that you could fit Soldier Field inside of it, right? So uh, yeah, end to end, you could fit the field at Soldier Field. It's over a hundred meters long, end to end. It's absolutely massive, right? And then at the back, you've got this, uh, this brackish water lake. Um, the only reason I have these photos, because it's also really hard to take pictures inside of a cave. It's hard to light it well. And the only reason I was able to light it is because these guys were from uh, National Geographic to film this show called The Greeks. You can Google it. It's, it's, and we're right at the very beginning. The show starts at Alapotripa. Um, and, uh, you know, it, you get a better sense of the breadth of the cave with 3D modeling that they can do in the, in the exhibition. So a big part of what we were focused on was helping Yorgos publish the material. We say in archaeology that if you spend decades meticulously excavating a site and then you don't publish it, you've spent decades looting a site. You need to publish it. If you don't publish the results of your work, nobody can ever learn from it. Nobody can ever build upon it. And so one of our, fo our foci as part of this was helping Yorgos work through four decades of excavated material, which is literally millions of pieces of pottery and hundreds of thousands of pieces of human and animal bone. Um, at the very entrance to the cave, uh, we, where there's a very deep trench, they had dug a very deep trench and caves are a pain for digging. They're really a pain because what happens is they're dynamic. You get an earthquake. You know, we were walking through the big room with my colleague Anastasia. We're walking through. I hadn't been there in a couple of years. And there's there's a block the size of a, a Volkswagen sitting in the middle of it. And she goes, oh, that's new. That must have just fallen last year off the top of the cave because that's what happens in caves. And so they're really hard to dig because you start to dig them and you run into a rock fall that you can't penetrate through. Then you've got to move the unit over and you have to re-excavate. So we had one very deep section that we had worked on. Uh, and this is my colleague, uh, Takis Karkapanayotis, Takis Karkanas, um, who's an expert in this field called micromorphology, taking samples from that, that deep section. Um, and so this deep trench right inside the entrance to the cave uh, has the entire sequence. So you go down to the very bottom and you're standing on the early Neolithic surface from 8,000 years ago. And then at the very top, several meters above it, you're on the 3,000 year old surface. So you have 3,000 years of history all within a four meter by four meter area and you can trace it all the way down. Um, and this is actually Takis' wife, Yoria, who's excavating here burials at the very bottom of that, of that, that cave sequence. So what's interesting about the cave itself is that it seems like places like this where we've got dates that go back to 6,000 BC, calibrated up to over 3,000 BC, calibrated. We've got some parts that were used for very long periods of time. In fact, because the cave was largely used for burials and other kinds of funerary ceremonies, because people don't live in caves, but they use them, because it was used for burials, 
we've got niches inside the cave. One little niche in this very complicated site in the middle of nowhere in Southern Mani. We've got one little niche that we can tell was used by individual families for 3,000 years. It's absolutely astonishing. These folks are passing down through oral tradition and oral knowledge where you need to put Yaya. This is where she's got to go in this niche in the cave. Not that niche, this niche. That's where it's got to go, right? Um, it's absolutely astonishing. And throughout the rest of the cave, we've got scattered bones. So in some instances, they're bringing into whole bodies and they're burying people inside the cave. In other instances, they're bringing a shoulder bone. They're bringing a part of a leg, a part of an arm, and they're tossing it in the back of the cave where they're conducting other kinds of rituals with smoke and fire and things like this that we can see archeologically. Um, and so this is what these ossuaries are, right? These ossuaries are these areas, these very specific niches where people are being brought from individual communities. I can talk about how we know that um, for thousands of years. And this is mind blowing to me, absolutely mind blowing because I, I, I still find it, I've been working on this for 20 years, this project. I still find it hard to wrap my brain around this idea that from the time of Christ until now and half again, you've got small villages passing down oral knowledge that long about where they need to bury people. It just, it blows my mind. Um, the way that we tried to put the, the, the cave into a broader archaeological context was by walking around and looking for stuff in archaeo we call this archaeological survey but it basically means we do it very systematically and very carefully and we document everything that we see but we basically walk all around the bay to try to identify other sites of different time periods that let us say how this site related to um the rest of the bay and so alapotripa is located right over here right there that's the entrance. Um, and we walked around and identified other sites. This is weird. This is the thing about Mani. Mani always gives you stuff that you don't expect to see. There was one other Neolithic site located right outside the entrance to the cave. No Bronze Age, which is weird on the Peloponnesos, but there's Bronze Age everywhere. Uh, a little bit of classical and Hellenistic material, but then lots of Byzantine and late Roman. And this is actually a very interesting pattern in Mani. It seems like whatever's going on demographically in Greece, in other parts of Greece, Mani's doing the opposite. Mani's frequently doing the inverse of the rest of the Peloponnesos. So for example, this is my former student who I'm now running a project with, Becky Seafried. Um, during the Ottoman occupation, Mani was the most densely inhabited part of Greece. Way higher population densities than any other part of Greece in Mani. Those little villages with those towers were chock a block of people. There were tons and tons of folks living there. Um, now you go to Mani and there's nobody. There's, it's, it's largely abandoned. Um, one of the things that we knew about was this promontory called Xagunaki, which was located right outside the entrance to the cave. So the cave, cave entrance is right here, right there. Uh, and this is located right outside in an area that was not destroyed by the road construction. Uh, and it was very obvious to us that there was a Neolithic use and habitation of this small promontory uh, from the, the survey. Uh, and you can see, you know, this is where we really suffer because everything, all of this is gone. It's all gone now. It's all at the bottom of the bay um, because it was all dynamited out for the roads. Um, so as we started to work at Xagunaki Promontory, um, we went in, we cleared it off. We had to clear off all of the growth because these were all terraced. 
You know, you, you think of Greece, you think of the beautiful manicured agricultural terraces with, you know, wheat and barley growing on them. Well, when you let those go for 80 years, they just overgrow with weeds and thorns and small trees and secondary growth. So the first thing we had to do was go in and carve them up. Then we go in and we divide it into 10 meter squares and we have everybody pick up all the stuff. And then we go, okay, there's more. The red shows you where there's more stuff that's ancient. And then based on that, we knew we use newfangled G whiz objects like geophysical equipment, which lets you measure things like uh, subtle changes in the Earth's magnetic field or the extent to which the ground lets electricity penetrate through it as a chance to try to see what's beneath the surface of the ground. And so these are my colleagues from uh, the Institute for Mediterranean Studies in Crete and in Rethymno, um, including my, my good friend, Apostolos Saris, um, who's the world's expert in these techniques. And we got out there and um, generated as much geophysical data. And we do this because digging in archeology span is destructive and really expensive and slow. So when you dig an archeological site, it's gone, right? You can't, re can't undig it, it's gone. Nobody can ever dig it again. All that's left is what we record from the site. Our pictures, our photos, our notes, um, and then our publications are what move forward. So when we try to dig, we try to be very careful and we try to be very surgical about what we're identifying when we're going after uh, different, different sites. So we ended up sinking two different uh, excavation blocks. These are just excavation units. Uh, that were identified and trying to trying to identify what was detected by the geophysical equipment. So, you know, it's like this series of scales. You start, okay, there's some stuff over there on that hill. Okay, there's stuff in that part of the hill. Within that part of the hill, it looks like within this couple meters square, there's something really interesting. That's where we draw our archaeological units. So in one of the units, we hit gold. We're very happy. We go down, it looks like a, a jumble of rocks, right? I agree, it looks like a jumble of rocks. Um, but when you actually look closer, you can see that there's a feature there and actually the corner of a wall of a structure that is stone built. The reason it's so confusing is because all of the stuff on top, all of this is rubble fill that was created when they made the terraces for agriculture. So they basically put rocks on top of the ancient wall. And then on top of that, they created a surface that they can farm because you can't farm on a slope. The reason you make terraces is because you're trying to make flat areas that you can use for agriculture. And in a place like Southern Mani, when it's mountain and rocky coast, you need to create those terraces if you want to have the largest, most dense population in Greece under Ottoman occupation, right? So um, uh, this is actually some of the only known architecture from this period in Greece. Uh, and in this instance, while those terraces screwed up a lot of stuff for us, they also helped preserve some of these objects for us. Uh, in a way that we don't have. There's no other architecture from the Neo this period of the Neolithic on the Peloponnesos. The closest we can get is um, uh, the islands. Actually, Andros is the closest we can get, Andros and Kea. So in the other excavation unit, block one, uh, we opened up, Start. we just started going into part of the terrace that had fallen out. We started excavating it back. Um, this is our very first map. And as we were going down, you, you know, you generally dig top to bottom. We're digging top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. We get to the bottom of this terrace and uh, we hit a baby. This is a baby skeleton. And actually there are two baby skeletons that are buried right next to each other on top of a pithos. And this was very exciting to us because this pithos is very diagnostic of the final Neolithic. This is very clearly ceramics that were only made during this one time during the fifth millennium in Greek prehistory. Um, 
So the next year, what, there's a rule in archaeology that you always find the most interesting thing the very last day of the season, and you can't finish it. So we go back the next year, uh, and as we're exposing the area in front of the baby skeletons, uh, we find a couple legs. First we find one leg, then we find another leg, then we find another leg, and then two more legs, uh, all in a pit that were associated with uh, the same time period, roughly, as the, the baby skeletons. And these are, uh, these are two individuals. Uh, the, we call them affectionately the spooners because they're spooning. Uh, the, the big spoon is male. Uh, the little spoon is female. Uh, and the Greek ministry made the interesting decision to release this uh, on Valentine's Day, you know, to the press, uh, which seems like, oh, such a sweet story. But when you actually start to think about it, two adult, healthy individuals ending up in the same pit ain't a good thing. That's not a, it's not a good story. Uh, and they were clearly buried together. Their, their limbs are intertwined. Um, you know, their hands cross over each other, their legs cross over each other. Um, so there's no question that they, you know, it's not like one person was buried and then another person was put there later. They were buried together. As we were exposing those two, uh, we noticed that just adjacent to them, there were also two more adult burials. Um, and in that instance, this is hard to see, but what you're looking at here is a pelvis and leg bones of someone that was thrown in on their back and another person that was thrown in on top of them. Uh, and it's unclear whether these two, um, we call these the, the 50 shades of gray couple because it also looks like one's hands were bound behind her back when she was thrown into the pit. Um, it's unclear whether, whether these are exactly contemporaneous, that is in the same pit, or whether they were at about the same time. And the reason that we couldn't tell that is because of this feature. So this feature that's on top of it, you see these stones that are in a little semicircle here? One, two, three, four, five. These define a semicircle that's on top of these and on top of these folks, right? So it's on top of it, which means that it's later archeologically. And the reason that we couldn't excavate fully that feature is because, boy, this was really weird. We were really kind of surprised. We've got these stones. We're looking at it from the top here. These are stones that identify a wall on the edge. And then these are pebbles. These are stream rolled pebbles. These don't occur on, in the middle of the hill. These come from the stream at the edge of the hill. And they were brought up to the top and deposited here in a very nice little pavement almost like a mosaic. Uh, and there are multiple layers of those stones that are brought up at different times from the stream bed, laid like a mosaic on the floor. And between them are human bones, thousands and thousands of human bones that were brought here and deposited between the layers of those stream rolled pebbles. We were super excited. We're like, this is amazing. We've got the same kind of behavior outside the cave that we have inside the cave, where you've got whole burials, like the spooners, and then you've got fragments of other individuals that are being brought here and being deposited here. So we're like, this is just incredible. It all lines up. And then we started finding pottery that dates to the end of the second millennium BC. This is Mycenaean pottery. Um, so this is 3,000 years, 2,000 years after the end of the Neolithic period. We've got exactly the same spot on the hill being used for burials. And in fact, this deposit was right on top of the baby burials, directly on top of the baby burials. They knew exactly where they were going. And here's the thing, the Mycenaeans don't do this. This is not Mycenaean behavior. Mycenaeans build those big Tholos tombs, like you go, if you go to Mykines, 
right? You see those big Tholos tombs that are stone built, right? They build chamber tombs where they'll dig deep holes into soft pockets in the limestone. They don't do this. This is a weird Maniot thing. But here we've got Mycenaeans showing up and doing exactly the same thing that Maniots had been doing for thousands of years, thousands of years before the Mycenaeans were around. Um, so these are different kinds of Mycenaean pottery. I'll never forget when my colleagues said, so we, do you think we need a Mycenaean dagger? Uh, and I looked over and sure enough, there was a bronze dagger. Um, so from all of this, we can, we can date this very precisely within the Mycenaean period. The next closest Mycenaean that we have is, is Sparti. That's the next closest Mycenaean site that we have. There's no other Mycenaean sites known from Southern Mani. Um, so this is really anomalous and a very special, very interesting part. But wait, there's more. Um, so as we start to excavate in this area around all of this, I mean, we're within, you know, we're within an area. Hundreds of dead people in that area. Um, and uh, all of these walls built on top of another. Uh, and as we get into it, we find inside one of the walls, a baby burial. This is a neonate um, infant. Uh, and it's exactly half of a baby burial. Uh, this, is, this is not something that happens because a dog tore it apart or something like this. This is half of a child that was placed in the wall. And this kind of behavior is more typical of the final Neolithic. This is something that, that we do see throughout Southern Greece. And it has to do with this idea that part of you must end up back in the cave. It, the story kept getting more and more interesting because one of the things that had been confounding our work in this tiny little area uh, were these massive stones that originally we thought were bedrock. We thought this was just bedrock limestone. And then my colleague, who's a geologist, came and said, but they're on their side. And we went, what? He said, yeah, they don't erode like that. These are, these are upturned stones. And so as we started looking at these upturned stones, and you can see them behind while we're digging here, right? Um, these are massive, massive stones. Uh, and uh, we realized that, that they were erected in linear fashion uh, across the hill, and they cross-cut the modern terraces. So they're not part of the modern terraces. Instead, it turns out, we can demonstrate through the archaeology where you can see that these stones are embedded in a surface, and then they've got other surfaces up against them that they were created during the Neolithic period. So not only do we have these burials that were created, we've got megalithic architecture that was created to make this a burial place back into the Neolithic period. And like I said, there's, there's nothing like this in, in the rest of Greece. This is a, a LIDAR survey. So you're looking at the topography of the hill and you can see these, the, those terraces that match the, the side of the hill, those are the modern terraces. That's what you do if you want to farm it, right? But these other ones, these, these black dots that are going in straight lines, those are all Neolithic walls that were created for the burials and the other structures that, that were included on the, on the hill. Part of the problem is these more recent terraces. So this is a profile looking at the, all of the rubble that was thrown into those more recent terraces. And the problem there is that it, it truncates the end of the story for us. We can't say what happened at the end because it was all carved up when they created these modern terraces. But what we can tell from the material that we excavate in those is that there was a village here. There was definitely a massive village. We've got all the stuff, animal bones, ceramics, stone tools, spindle whorls for making thread, um, celts for, for uh, axes. This is all the stuff that you see on Neolithic settlements. So what we can do from all of this is, um, and, and just to give you a sense, in these two small excavation units, we had 40,000 pieces of ceramics. So 40,300 kilograms 
of ceramics just from these two little excavations. That's a lot of stuff, right? Um, and so it was a very dense settlement. We can tell from these numbers. There were a lot of people living here. So when we go back and, and look at this, um, look at the story, the, the sort of narrative that we can create, what we can see is that um, people were living in the cave, the entrance to the cave, and started to use the cave as a burial place about 8,000 years ago. Over the next several thousand years, that burial place became so important that it became almost like a pilgrimage site where people were being brought not only from southern Greece, but from throughout the eastern Mediterranean to be buried in part or in whole inside that cave. At about 4,300 BC, so a little over 6,000 years ago, the site outside exploded. And that's when people moved to the exterior of the cave. They were moving there because, you know, just like nowadays, important ritual centers, um, they create their own economy. There's a there there. People will move to it because there's opportunity, because there are people coming through there. The same way that Delphi, right, in northern Greece was a very important ritual center, but it was also a huge economic and political center within the functioning of the Greek city-states. Um, outside, we can see this in a nutshell. If we look backwards in time, where we've got the modern terrace wall, right? And then that's built on top of the Mycenaean ossuary, which dates to about 1400 BC. That's on top of the infant burials, which date to the end of the fourth millennium BC. They're on top of the double burials and the other double burials, and all of those are included within the megalithic wall that was built sometime around 7,000 years ago, right? So just from this tiny little excavation, we can eke out a pretty interesting story about what happened at this spot on the Southern Greek mainland. Uh, the, there are no parallels for this. Uh, there's one site that is close, it's a little bit later in date, and that site is um, called Strophilas on the island of Andros in the Cyclades. Um, it's in a very similar situation on a, on a you know, a promontory uh, just above the sea, uh, but this is a site that's never been fully published, um, so we don't really know. There's a little bit of, you know, oh, there's a, a, a two-page documentation over here, but we don't really know much about the site. Um, one of the things that they have at Strophilas, and this is key to this part of Greek prehistory, is, um, here it is. So this is on one of the walls that they have at Strophilas. They've got the de depiction of this, uh, which is a long boat. So this is, this is a boat that was created in the 4th century BC. That means trade is exploding, right? And these are oarsmen. So the whole idea is this is a boat with oarsmen. And we see it depicted uh, in many different forms, but largely on these uh, frying pans that date to the early Bronze Age. Again, this is a little later, but you can see here's a long boat, right? It's got a little fishy up here. They frequently have a little fishy up at the top. Uh, and then they've got all of these oars and then this sort of characteristic just depiction of waves. And we see this at the fourth millennium. So again, this site's a little bit later than what we have, um, but it gives us a sense that, that Alapotripa and Ksagunaki might not have been just one-offs. Um, the other thing that's really intriguing, uh, and this is research that we're still working on, is that uh, the notion that the cave collapsed, cave entrance collapsed around 3000 BC, um, seems to have been associated with a wider cataclysmic event that might have affected other sites in Southern Greece. This is really hard to document because it, it's hard, we date most of these things through radiocarbon dating, but it's really hard with radiocarbon dates to say things were synchronous. But one of the other sites, so we had this massive settlement 
in front of Alapotripa, Anksagunaki, and in the adjacent area that was destroyed by the road building. Um, but there's another site over uh, near Naflio, a little bit south. It's like from Naflio, you go to Naflio to Tolo, and then down into the Argolid. And uh, this is the site of Frankthi. And Frankthi is a, a, another cave site that had an occupation. Unfortunately, here, the same occupation that we have at Xagunaki is all underwater, because here the bay has uh, sea levels come up, the bay has gone down, and so the sites are underwater. But it seems to have been abandoned at exactly the same time. And so we're trying to come up with innovative new research methods that would let us demonstrate whether this is one really big earthquake that knocked out a bunch of sites and in a way created a new world for everybody living in southern Greece at this time period around 3000 BC. OK, I just want to talk really briefly. So this is the new project that I'm working on. This is a project that um, focuses. So Diros is uh, right here. That's Diros Bay. And now we're working down here. So now we're working in the southern part of the Mani Peninsula. This, uh, this peninsula down here is called Matapan. Um, and this is a great view. So we're looking south towards the Matapan Peninsula. And this is where we have that site uh, that I mentioned before, the site of Tainaron. So Tainaron was, uh, there was an archaic temple established there at, at the beginning of the 6th century BC. Uh, and it was, a, it was a sanctuary of Poseidon, and it was associated with a death oracle. And as part of that death oracle, um, you know, and there are many death oracles, uh, Elefsina is uh, Eleusis, Elefsina outside of Athens on the road over to Corinth. That's also a death oracle. Delphi is also a, a death oracle. Uh, and this is one of those sites that became very important during the Archaic and then the Classical period and then remained really important during the Roman period. And because it was a sanctuary site, that meant that like after Mark Antony uh, lost a very big battle at a place called Actium. He and his army overnighted at uh, Tainaron on their way back to, to the Italian peninsula. Um, and there's almost no work that's been done here. It's, it's really just absolutely wide open. And so we've built a project, much like we did at Alapotripa, where we want to go in and document everything, do survey of the area around it, uh, and this is a project that I'm running with. So my former graduate student on the right, Becky Seyfried, um, uh, who's a specialist in post-Roman Byzantine Ottoman Greece, uh, and my colleague from Acadia University, Chelsea Gardner, who also worked on our project in, in Greece, and she's a classical archeologist. And so this is the way we generally put together these kinds of projects is, I'm a prehistorian. I do the real early stuff. Chelsea does the, the, the classical archaic Roman stuff. And then Becky does the later material. And then we build the team from there. And so we're very excited because we just got, after about three years of working with the Greek uh, archaeological service, we just got our permit uh, for a pilot project that we're going to start next May. Uh, and that project will for focus on uh, the the eastern part of the Mani uh, at this little town called Porto Cayo. And so we're going to start here doing a little, um, a, a little survey as a pilot to develop the relationship with our colleagues in Sparta. And then from there, we will work out. And so this is a very exciting project that we're, we're just embarking on now. I'm getting up there in age. I see this as like my last big hurrah in Greece. This is probably my last big project. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to do it and also excited to pass the, uh, pass the torch on to my younger colleagues. Um, and so we're in the process of fundraising for that. We just got a grant from the Canadian equivalent of the National Science Foundation, uh, uh, Social Science Humanities Research Council. And we're currently trying to apply for more of your tax dollars, thank you, through the National Endowment for the Humanities. So, um, uh, this is a really exciting, exciting project. Okay, so I've talked enough. I just want to say that uh, 
you know, when when I did uh, another ex, it wasn't the Greeks exhibition, but an exhibition shortly after that, uh, I got fan mail, which you never get as an ex. When you develop an exhibition, people always want to say, you got that wrong. You didn't get that right. You should have had this you know, maps and timelines especially annoy people because they say, well, why didn't you have this on there, right? Um, in this instance, a guy from the suburbs wrote me and he said, I really enjoyed this exhibition. It reminded me of this quote of G.K. Chesterton. Uh, and I thought, wow, this guy actually paid attention, which you're thrilled when somebody actually pays attention. And uh, he got it. Like he really got it. And this is this is really why we do archaeology is because it affords us this opportunity to look back on the past and figure out how we got where we are. And so when we do these kinds of research projects and we develop these kinds of exhibitions, uh, this is really where we want to get to is we want to try to understand the world that we live in today by studying the deep past. And so through through my work, you know, that has really been in looking at these issues of false starts. We can't just study successes. We also need to study things that didn't work. Alapotripa and Sabunaki never turned into a big Bronze Age city. They didn't. Why? Was it that earthquake? Was that earthquake so disruptive that it disrupted settlement to the extent that it wasn't a thousand years until we saw big cities like that in this part of Greece? It's unclear. Um, the other thing that I've come a lot, when I was in graduate school, when I was an undergraduate, all of the models were push models. The reason people live together is for security. They're forced to live together out of defense. Well, you know, academically, People run for the hills just as much when, when they're under pressure. Um, and I think one of the things we've learned in my years of being an archaeologist is that people are pulled into places. People go places where there's something going on. People are attracted to cities. That's why cities are growing. There's jobs there. There's opportunities. There's nightclubs. There's girls. You know, there's stuff that you can do in a big city that you can't find in little small towns like where I grew up, right? And so we need to really consider pull models in a way that we haven't effectively. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it's all got to work. Like the thing about culture and society is it's all got to work. It's all got to gotta jive at the same time for it to last. And so by understanding those false starts, and understanding what doesn't work, we actually are in a position to better understand those instances that, that did work. So thank you very much, Faristo. Thank you for coming out. Really, I'm happy to take questions. Hello. Uh, really quick question, because I was going to ask, uh, in 16, around the 16th century, I believe you said that uh, the mining was really densely populated. And what you just said uh, made me wonder why it was depopulated. Is it Was it the draw of the major urban centers when the Greek state, like yeah. Athens, did everybody leave towards Athens yeah, for the, the, the nightclubs, the girls, the jobs? Well, and uh, politics, you know, uh, things got pretty rough in Southern Greece in the seventies and a lot of people moved to Athens and never moved back. And now most folks, especially most Greek Americans that I meet that have a link to the Mani, they're from Athens, but their family was originally from Mani. Right. Um, and that's exactly it. Uh, you know, during the junta, a lot of folks moved to, to Athens and the economy collapsed. Um, and, you know, there, there was just no, it became cheaper to buy wheat from Ukraine. So nobody was growing wheat, you know, and Monty's still weird in that way, right? There's, you're used to flocks of lamb, goat in Greece, right? Especially elsewhere in the Peloponnesos, there's lamb flocks and goat flocks. We have cows. There are cows in Monty, way more cows, flocks, herds of cows than you see, uh, herds of sheep and goat. It's really weird. 
Um, but cows can eat stuff that sheep and goat won't. Um, so it's still very, very um, striking to me, given my experience, you know, of 30 years of working elsewhere in Greece, I'm still constantly struck by the things that surprise me in Mani. So, Randy, so did you have a... This is the first time I've heard someone use the word zebilia, and I'd like to commend you on your command of the Greek language. Oh. <laughs> I wonder how many people in this room know what that is. It's an old, very old word, zembilia, a zembilia, plex sanita zembilia. They wove the zembilia. Yeah, it's probably a Turkish word originally, but it's a, um, it's a basket. It, so the, the zembilia are what we use uh, for excavation. Is it Arabic? Yeah. They're baskets, and they're like these leather, black leather baskets with handles that are awesome for excavation, for carrying dirt. Um, okay. You said that you studied the growth of cities in your study at the peak of those major cities in classical times. What kind of population figures uh, did you come up with? Uh, it depends. It depends where you are. Uh, yeah, Rome, Rome got really big. Rome was was several hundred thousand uh, at its peak. You know, the, the kind of growth that we've seen in the 20th century is just, you know, when I was born, there were four billion people, 1970. There's eight now, eight billion people. And so, you know, our scales are very different. You know, cities of 13 million people in China that is a, a small secondary center, right? Uh, th those scales are very different because we were never dealing with cities of millions of people in the, in the deep past. But what's interesting is that uh, in studies that have compared modern cities to ancient cities, Archaeologists were the first ones to say, oh, it was a different world. It was pre-industrial. Things were different in the past. But as there are more and more sociological studies, what you learn is that there are certain things that factor the same in ancient cities and modern cities. So, for example, infrastructure. Infra infrastructure has a linear scaling, right? In a city with 10 million people, you got about 10 times as many roads as a city with 1 million people. Other stuff increases exponentially. Clubs, anything social, cafes. In a city of 10 million people, there are way more theaters, cafes, bars, uh, you know, you name it, uh, social clubs, than a city with 1 million people, and way more than 10 times more. And so these factors scale across, and this was actually really surprising to archaeologists. Many archaeologists didn't believe it until there was so much overwhelming evidence that we realized we could actually study ancient culture to understand what's going on in modern culture. Rome, at its peak, it had uh, close to a million people. Have you heard of that? And that's late, late, late. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was talking about sort of early, the early inception of these towns, but that itself, insane, right? That's huge. Pre-industrial, right? Any other questions? I'll be right there with the microphone, yes. Yes. When you were excavating in the cave on Mani, did you find any kind of... God started or whatever, but... So the gods... We know the gods were there by the end of the Bronze Age, right? Because Homer is writing down about Bronze Age cultures. And we can see in things like Mycenaean frescoes and in some of the Mycenaean terms that are used, because we can read Mycenaean Greek, linear B. So by the end of the second millennium, we know the gods are there. How far they go back into the past is really hard to call, right? At this time, we're, we're separated by 3,000 years. So we're, we're 3,000 years be before that. It's hard to say. But we do know they're doing weird stuff in that cave that is almost certainly interesting funerary rituals that are built around 
uh, smoke and fire. We presume that they're worshiping some kind of God in all of that, but which ones it is related to the later ones is really hard to tell. So Egypt wouldn't have played any kind of a, you know. No, they, even in the Mycenaean period, even in the 12th century BC, uh, the our, our friends, the Mycenaeans, were kind of out of the Egyptian loop. The Egyptians were way more interested in what was going on in the Near East and Cyprus, where all the metal was coming from, than what was going on in the Aegean. The Aegean didn't really become prominent until the 8th century. And that's when you start to get sort of the expansion of city-states and the establishment of Greek colonies up the Adriatic coast, up into the Black Sea, uh, you know, over into places like Sicily. So before that, they're, they're kind of out of the loop. So it's hard to tell exactly who the gods are, but we can see the behavior and there's certainly ritual activity going on. Does that work? Yeah, yeah I got two. Uh, one, that cave that you explored, the one that they blasted. So you're telling us, if I understand correctly, that in the front of the cave, they're having fun, they live, they eat, etc. Now they die, they take the corpse and they dump it in the back of the cave. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not uncommon. Um, so there's there's two things. One is the the like I said, people don't live in a cave. You don't have, you know, this whole idea of having entire communities. It's it's Star Trek, right? Entire communities living in the back. People will hide in caves, absolutely. And we know in the Ottoman period that happened here. But people don't generally have communities that live in the back of a cave. They're they're not good places to be, right? Front of the cave. Many communities live at the front of a cave where it's open. You have access to your agricultural fields. You have access to animals. One of the keys here is the collection of water because we've got water in the back of the cave. In Southern Mani, water is a big deal. It's still a very big deal. And we can tell from the Roman period until now, based on the sides of the cisterna that they built, they're huge, massive cisterns that they're building to collect any water they can collect throughout the years. Um, so we know that's an issue. And what's going on in the front of the cave is the collection of water in these large vatri. Huge, huge, huge pits that they're digging and lining with clay to collect water that's dripping off. And then they're living outside the front of the cave, not inside the front, but outside the front of the cave, which is the problem that we can't see much of it, except for where we caught it, where they didn't destroy it with uh, the road building. So my second part is uh, you said that the, um, the, uh, there was a destruction, Earth made destruction, you know, like... Uh, Earthquake, etc. Yeah, you you gave it a date, three thousand. Is that falling somewhere with a catastrophe at Akrotiri? Uh, no, it's before. Did we have about the same it's, situation? No, right it's there? before. So right, Akrotiri. Before. Right, so Akrotiri is Minoan. 2000. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so it's about based on when the eruption. And remember, that was the the, the eruption of the volcano at Ak. So Akrotiri is a Minoan site. Uh, located on Tierra and Santorini, um, that was buried in the eruption of, of the volcano, which establishes the caldera that you can still see in Santorini in the bay. Um, you know, nobody goes on the boat, right? Um, and uh, so that would have been later. But that, different people anyway, because yeah. they were developed and these guys were... Right, uh, right. So it was about a thousand years later. Years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's not maybe not really important, but when you said something about the baby that was buried, the bone, and there was half half yep. the baby, are you implying or that it was cut in half and thrown like that, and another part saved for yeah. another location? Yeah. It. Um, yeah. It was the baby was cut in half. Uh, and absolutely ritualistic. We we suppose the other half is inside the cave. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, because it's 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 perfectly art. I mean, it's literally perfectly articulated, right? Uh, and it's a fragile baby. And so it wasn't like 
it was torn apart by carnivores or something that came in and it, it was, it was cut in half, deliberately. right? Deliberately cut in half. All right, just another and this point. is something that actually we see frequently is people will, you'll find people without an arm that was cut off in the, you have the other burial outside and then the other part is somewhere else. And inside the back of the cave, we don't have many full inhumation burials. It's all different chunks of people. When I ask how do you, your particular, how does your particular crew and archaeologists happen to go there? Are there other archaeologist groups that want to go there or how does that work? Yeah, well, actually, that's a that's a real interesting story. Um, we've so we published the book uh, right before COVID. We got it to, to Yorgos before he died. Um, we got the book. My colleagues and I are still working on when you do projects like this, you work on the materials for decades afterwards there's always some new technique that you can use to analyze stuff that you found um we would like to get back there but right before covid um the greek government the ministry got a huge grant from uh the european research council to completely redo uh the whole cave from the the geological caves with the little boats that you get pushed through they're gonna build it all out, put up a restaurant, new museum. Uh, in, in 2019, uh, my student went and inventoried everything in the museum. Um, we moved everything into containers, uh, you know, container trucks, uh, and nothing has happened uh, since then, uh, zero. The museum, everything is exactly the same. And so everything's just stopped right now. Our research on the materials continues, um, but you know, it, it ended up with everybody suing everybody because you know somebody put in a bid to do the project and they weigh under bid. And then during COVID they're like, we can't do it. So then, and so it's all just uh, been a, a bit of a, of a real unfortunate mess. Um, but our work on the materials continues. Sorry. Two, two summers ago, my daughter and I went in the cave uh -huh. and uh, we took a, a ride on a boat, just maybe half an hour boat. Yeah. But we didn't hear anything about all the uh, no. history that you're talking to us about. Nope. There used to be right above it. The entrance to this cave was right above where you walk into. You know, they've got the the statue of the Maniot woman yes. with the the sickle, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. F fighting the Turks up in in yeah. uh, uh, in Mani. In Mani, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, right above that is the entrance to Alapotripa, but you would never know it because the museum doesn't exist and it's closed down now. And another question, you, you said that, that money was populated, uh, densely po po populated. During the Turkish occupation, yep. I believe money was kind of uh, free. Yep, especially if you ask Maniots, they will tell you that they were free the whole time. And right now there is a serial on Greek TV Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. This and this is a huge thing, right? This TV, which isn't actually filmed in Mani, but uh, it's about Mani. It's about Mani. Yeah. It, it is taking place in one of the towers there. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah. It's, it's called the Magisa. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's <laughs> I'm right. I'm following it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and actually it's, it's, there are now, we're now getting, you know, five star resorts being built in Southern Mani. Um, you know, which is good and bad, right? I mean, it's good to have some tourism there. The problem is that uh, they frequently are built in places where there also are also archaeological sites, and that creates other problems. But this show, absolutely, it's created a renewed interest in Mani. So there's yes. kind of, you can go stay in a tower on Airbnb now for $500 a night in a stone tower. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank very you. Thank you. Excuse me. Is any other um, uh, like uh, 
like this in any other place in Europe? Um, there are it's big a like this. It's a great question. No, is the, sh the short answer is no, not in this time period. Um, and in uh, Italy, in southern Italy, interesting, there are cave sites from the Neolithic where people are collecting water. So that seems to have been a tradition, but there's no nothing like the hundreds of burials and tens of thousands of human remains, other parts of burials and skeletons that we have in Alapo. There's there's really nothing else like it. Um, tens of thousands. Yeah, tens of thousands. The woman, okay, so um, the, the woman with, so the question is, who does the woman represent? Um, and so it, right at the entrance to Taspiliatu Viru, there's a great Maniot woman holding a sickle, right? Um, and it was, during, it was during the Ottoman occupation, there was a force um, that had gone up to Kalamata, and so all of the men in the village had gone up to Kalamata to fight. And so all that was left were, were the women in the village in Diros. And when the Ottomans attacked, the women went with sickles and beat off the Ottoman warriors. And so every year in June, it's actually a hell of a lot of fun. If you want to go, um, the, there's a reenactment in Diros uh, where they take a statue of a woman, uh, like a, it's kind of like a skeleton crow, you know, she's got, she's got the, you know, the, the black handkerchief on and she's filled and they throw her off the, off the, the edge of Sagunaki to reenact the, the fighting against the Ottomans. Stefanos, did you have a question? Yeah. I had three questions. Oh boy. Uh, first one, I hope I'm not taking too much of your time. No. Okay. Uh, how did you reach that spot, that location, and how do you think the people you, in prehistoric times, find that place? Uh, so, well, we get there by driving, right? And in my opinion, this is one of the real unfortunate parts of travel in modern Greece, is that you know I'm I'm young enough, old enough, to remember uh, when there was a really robust ferry boat system in Greece. And it was way more efficient to go from Piraeus anywhere in Greece by boat than it was by car, right? And uh, that's the way 99% of humanity has experienced Greece is by boat. You wouldn't drive anywhere. I mean, Kyriakos, my buddy would tell me that his father would, would take the boat up to Kalamata a couple times a week, right? Um, it was not a big deal, but to drive there is now four hours on, you know, kind of a bad windy road. So, so I really feel like while the, 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 uh, ethnic or the, the, the national highways have, uh, made it a lot easier to get around. Uh, I really feel like they've skewed people's perspectives on what it was like to travel that landscape, even 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. And it's not good. It's not good because, you know, this site was built up on the coast so that it could be seen. People knew it was there because you could see it if you were sailing by, right? So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so they probably yeah, obviously arrived there by boat from probably another location. Right. Uh, second question. Uh, are the artifacts found exhibited in uh, which museum? So they were exhibited in this museum, but now that museum is closed. Diros, um, in Diros? Uh, in Diros, yeah. Okay. And now uh, they're not on display. I don't, I don't even think there's anything on display in Athens. We had brought some from the cave. When we did the Greeks exhibition, I did an exhibition at the Field Museum on Alepotripa. Um, that was specifically about, and I'd interviewed Yorgos Papadonosopoulos, and um, we had some of the objects on display there, but currently there are no objects on display. I don't think there are any even at, even at the, the National Museum in Athens. Uh, 
the National Archaeological Museum. And the third question is um, those findings in uh, uh, the Greek media. Uh, yeah, actually, like I said, the um, they announced the uh, the Spooners on Valentine's Day. I think it was 2016 or 2017 they announced that. Um, and then we have published the book and we're still generating other publications. So there okay. was a there was a little splash. There's always a lot going on in archaeology in Greece. And usually people aren't interested in really old Neolithic stuff. You know, they're more excited about a you know, Macedonian helmet or something like yes. that, right? Thank you. Uh, any other last questions? We're wrapping up right now. Oh, okay. I'm surprised that uh, the Greek government isn't more concerned with, uh, with preserving these uh, archaeological sites. They are. Um, in fact, you know, uh, you know, things have changed since the 50s. So, you know, when the site was discovered in the late 50s and the Greek tourism ministry got a hold of it, uh, since then, there's been the development of a very good system of monitoring archaeological sites. The problem is all the sites are on the coast and the coast is the area that's being developed. And so uh, my colleagues in the, the Ephoria and the, the Greek archaeological service are just absolutely overwhelmed. You know, they've got too much going on. In Sparta, for example, they're trying to rebuild a museum, a new museum, because the old Sparta museum wasn't great. Well, when they go to dig the new museum, you know what they find? More stuff from ancient Sparta, right? And so it's, uh, it's really Sisyphean in many ways, the work that my colleagues in the archaeological service are, are doing. So it's not, it's not lack of will. Um, it's lack of, of personnel. And, you know, it's political. And so it really depends which government you have in when and, you know, and what they're investing in. And if they're interested in investing in development, then they're generally not interested in investing in archaeology um, because those things frequently run, you know, they're at loggerheads with each other. Pardon me? Is the Greek government's budget for archaeological explorations steady or does it increase or does it uh, impact based on which political party is involved? Uh, yes, yes, it, it, it is impacted by which political party is in power. And um, I know last year, all of the, the, Greek the Greek archaeological community formed a union um, because they're federal employees, they're employed by the national government, um, but they were concerned about the cultural heritage in the country. And so they had established the union to try to try to get a little bit more legging with the, the government, a little bit more footing. Um, so, of course, it fluctuates. You know, anything that's federally funded like that is going to, you know, and in a parliamentary system um, where you've got, you know, interesting alliances that are being built by sometimes very divergent parties, you never know what's going to happen. Right. So uh, I think it's constantly challenging. We do. Yeah, I'm talking about my Greek colleagues who work in Greece and who are in charge of monitoring archaeological sites. Yeah. Um, no, they don't have time. They, they don't really have the opportunities for private funding in Greece that we do. Um, in fact, there are issues like when, when I get a National Endowment for the Humanities grant and take it to Greece, I can't pay my colleagues because it violates a Greek law that they can't accept money because they're a federal institution in Greece, right? So it, it gets really complicated that way. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. I uh, hope to see everybody at our next event. Uh, Sunday, November 10th at the Four Points by Sheridan. How about a nice round of applause again for our guest today, Dr. William Parkinson. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.